Chapter 2 The Lamb and the Lion When the short day is brightest, with frost and fire, the brief sun flames the ice on pond and ditches. In windless cold that is the heart's heat, reflecting in a watery mirror, a glare that is blindness in the early afternoon, and glow more intense than blaze of branch or brazier, stirs the dumb spirit, no wind but Pentecostal fire in the dark time of the year. T.S. Eliot. The winter of 1989 brought to North Texas a wave of bitter cold. Though it would not be a white Christmas, the Arctic air would keep us close to the hearth on Christmas Eve, warming our hands and hearts by the fire. Midnight passed and dawn would soon be arriving, except for us, there was a different light about to burst on the horizon. At two o'clock in the morning, Gunner, our Himalayan cat, tore us from the depths of our slumber with a siren-like scream. It was not, however, to announce the landing of Donner and Blitzen on our roof. He was warning us that something far more sinister had arrived through a construction flaw in the chimney of our wood-burning stove. Fortunately, Gunner became the smoke alarm that was missing in our country home. By the time we awoke, fire had consumed most of the living room, and every normal exit from our split-level home was blocked by flames and billowing smoke. Our only chance for survival was to jump out of a second-floor window with a few clothes and Gunner in hand. From the yard we watched as most of our worldly possessions went up in flames, including most of my art. In utter exhaustion and despair, my husband, Brian, and I fell asleep late on Christmas afternoon in my mother's house with Gunner at our feet. We had been sleeping for several hours when I was startled from my dreams with Brian's fingers nudging me in the ribs. Wake up, honey! Less than 24 hours ago, I had suddenly been awakened on the brink of disaster. What now? His voice was brimming with excitement. I just had a dream that you are going to paint a great portrait of Jesus Christ, and somehow the fire was necessary for that to occur. You're delirious, I mumbled. Go back to sleep. Not impressed that his dream could be a divine message, I told myself that he was feeling the prayers and the sympathies of our friends. I pulled up the covers and returned to my private retreat. Brian's enthusiasm for the dream was undaunted by either his night's rest or my rebuff. As we sat down for breakfast the next morning, he mentioned it again. I explained to him the synchronicity that must surely be existing between our vulnerability and the concern of others for our plight. As they hold us in their thoughts and prayers, we could become the recipients of many spiritual blessings. Let's be grateful. But for heaven's sake, don't project beyond that. I thought about giving him a lesson in art history, detailing how, since the rise of literacy and the mass availability of Bibles, religious art had become a secondary medium for delivering God's messages to the earth. Consequently, artists of creative power had gone on to more expressive fields of endeavor where creative liberties were permitted. But I hadn't had my coffee yet and didn't feel like explaining all that, so I gave him the short version. My whole career had revolved around secular art, and I was not about to jeopardize the name recognition I had worked so hard to attain among my peers and collectors by painting Jesus pictures. Besides, I just wanted to put the pieces of our life back together, and that meant putting them back the way they were. Without a place to work, my painting career would have to be on hold anyway. Brian's job kept him on the road most days of the week, so I went to work full-time rebuilding our lives. Through an odd serendipity, we found a charming old stone house with an acre of land at the north edge of Fort Worth. 
The ranch style home needed excessive re renovation, yet we were strangely drawn to the additional bonus that it was still zoned for agriculture. Anyone who has ever remodeled a house knows how consuming it can be. For six months, we ate, slept, and literally breathed the reconstruction of our new home. Brian helped on weekends, but it was my full-time job. Actually, it was good therapy, putting back what had been destroyed. And by the time the house was finished, I felt somewhat restored myself and ready to paint again. Yet something had changed in my heart. Perhaps the magnitude of our recent loss had generated a sense of practical anxiety in me. For the first time in my life as an artist, I didn't just set up my easel and paint from the depths of my inner vision. Instead, I studied the market, analyzing patterns of supply, demand, and success. Although my new work lacked the power of the lost masterpieces, it did have a lovely appeal, technical strength, and an excellent chance of competing successfully in the marketplace. With that hope in mind, Brian and I packed in the car and trekked to a major dealer's show in Los Angeles in the fall of 1991. After five days, we picked up some nice orders and made a number of promising gallery affiliations, but the show had not been an overwhelming success by any means. However, something of much greater importance happened in that huge convention center. I saw myself for the first time conforming to a segment of the artistic world primarily devoted to establishing name recognition by volume production and commercial success. Many an artist would have danced with glee to have the level of success which I had achieved by other standards. After all, I had produced pro portraits for many prominent Americans, including the president pro tempore of the U.S. Senate. My portrait of Dr. Paul Peck was hanging in the Smithsonian Institution, while another of my paintings was hanging in the Museum of the City of New York. I had a New York publisher, and many of my paintings were in prominent collections around the country. Altogether, my resume reflected talent, success, and real acceptance by the keepers of excellence within the art community. So what was this nagging recrim recrimination I had about also establishing a measure of commercial viability? The flavor of external pursuit was leaving a bitter aftertaste. With a sense of surrender, I resolved to use the rest of my traveling time for personal renewal. If possible, I would locate a still point of peace within myself where true motives could be examined and reestablished. On a whim, we detoured from the interstate in Arizona, traveling to Sedona and the beautiful Red Rock country south of Flagstaff. Though there was no obvious event, something happened amidst those ancient sandstone spires because the next morning I felt revitalized and confident to handle whatever was to come. There was a sense that things would be different. Just how different was still to be revealed. Homeward bound, it seemed as if we flew through New Mexico. As I was listening to the music of Mozart and allowed its beauty to give my soul wings, it was easy to review my life and highlight the things I considered most important. Eventually, a silence flooded me, and nothing seemed to be of value except the need to arrive at a new beginning. Without consideration of its impact, I turned to Brian and said, If I dropped my career, would you mind? No, he said. You do whatever you need to do. What were 30 plus years of hard work after all? There was an inner confidence that something else would come along. If I had known what it was to be, I might have been less relaxed about the whole matter. As we drove across the high mesa, my sense of relief matched the expansive horizon. In that desert quietness, 
There was a peaceful reverie which brought to mind impressions of incredible beauty. Though I am accustomed to receiving and playing with visual images, these stood out as extraordinary. Just as I relaxed into my inner sanctuary, Brian asked for the first time in several months, Have you thought about that painting of Jesus lately? I started to bristle at his intrusion. Of all things to talk about, why did he mention that subject again? He had brought it up at regular intervals since his dream, and I had never responded in any way to make him think that my original position had changed even a smidgen. With my eyes still closed, I tried to suggest that I was half asleep by mumbling, no more than you'll let me forget. With gentle persistence, he encouraged me to consider all possibilities now that I stood on the threshold of a new opportunity. Immediately, a beautiful landscape emerged on my mental screen, fields leading down to a lush green river valley and, on its banks, a tree with a split trunk under an azure sky with billowing clouds. This was quite unusual, as my self-generating imaginings rarely took the form of landscapes. Its beauty resonated profoundly through my whole being. Brian must have sensed what I was experiencing, for right at that moment he asked, What are you thinking about? I'm not thinking about anything. I'm looking at a beautiful landscape in my mind's eye. Oh. A minute or so passed then. If you were to paint Jesus, he said sweetly, how would you do it? That's a pointless question, because I'm not going to take on the project for all the following reasons. My hope was that if I itemized every objection, then at least the whole proposition could be dismissed. I had a master's degree in art history from Tulane University, and my area of specialization was medieval European art, which, by and large, is Christian. So I was well equipped to explain that the history of Christian art had derived its formulas from theology. It had its own symbolic language, which served as a teaching tool and a theological reinforcement. This had been necessary because historical facts were scanty and creative inspiration too often exceeded the boundaries of church doctrine. A case in point occurred when Michelangelo almost lost his life by taking liberties with the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. The Pope was a man of theological protocol and the artist was a man whose vision into eternal realms was untouched by formula. I knew of no historical descriptions of Jesus, and certainly there were none in the New Testament. For a portraitist, that alone was enough to stop the project in its tracks. Moreover, I knew enough about the art of portrayal from my years as a portraitist to respect the intimate relationship between body and soul. In other words, no other man could pose for Jesus and project the right feelings into a painting. Now, if those objections were not enough, I was adamant that I would not invent a portrayal of the master. In the world of imagination, I felt that everyone had an equal right to see him in his own way. Therefore, I was certainly not going to impose my private preferences upon the consciousness of others. With a sense of finality, I presented my closing consideration in hopes of barring the door to any further discussion. I'll tell you what, if he shows up for a sitting, I'll paint him. Brian diplomatically backed off for a moment, but he wasn't finished. All too soon he asked, if you were going to paint him, what would you call the painting? Too exasperated to protest anymore, I started to say, I don't know. When the strangest thing happened, a visual arrow shot through my mind with a trailing banner on which appeared the words, the lamb and the lion. Momentarily stunned, I couldn't think or edit my perceptions, so I just repeated the words aloud in a distant voice. Brian said something, but I didn't hear him. I was too absorbed in the realization that I would, indeed, 
be doing the painting that his dream had foretold. But how? Had I not established all the impossible conditions? All I could do was consent to give it my best effort. When we got home, I gave myself three months to research any available material which might support the project. As a start, I reread the New Testament, which was of little help since it does not contain a physical description of Jesus, although there are some clues which suggested physical attributes. For example, that he was born into the house of David, that he was a carpenter and a fisherman, and that he was physically strong enough to carry a massive cross after enduring brutal torture. Focusing on his livelihood as a carpenter, my study revealed that carpenters of that time were not just skilled in measuring and joining wood together for the construction of buildings. They were also required to go into the forest, fell the tree, and transform it into the lumber they would use. Clearly, carpentry of 2,000 years ago was a job for a veritable Paul Bunyan of a man. Knowing that the master's family belonged to the house of David within the tribe of Judah, I studied the recorded attributes of those people. Each of the twelve tribes of Israel had its own character, appearance, and domain. Then, as now, genetic potential in Israel was greater than limiting stereotypes might tend to suggest. Ten of the twelve tribes had disappeared when the Babylonians scattered the Jewish people in the Diaspora the lost tribes of Israel that we often read about. Only the lines of David and Benjamin, the Levites, and rem remnants of other tribes returned home. From David came the rulers, aristocrats, and military elite of Jewish society, a fact which made them the target of conquerors. When the Romans took control of the Holy Land, they decimated the line of David, leaving the others to carry on. Centuries later, as medieval Europeans returned from pilgrimages to the Holy Land, they would bring home descriptions of that limited sample of Jewish potential commingled with memories of Arab and other Middle East people costumed in typical desert attire. These reports were often biased and formed the backbone of oversimplified pictorial descriptions which persist even into modern times, most especially in Christian art. Within the few surviving descriptions of ancient Jews, there can be found references to the tribe of Judah as often being taller and the fairest of the fair. When asking my Semitic friends as to the meaning of fair in their world, I was cautioned not to assume that it would likely mean blonde in the Nordic sense. However, it could include light olive to fair skin with hair ranging from light golden brown to red brown and eyes from hazel to blue green. Although he might have appeared in different ways to different people, the charisma which drew strangers and crowds to him tends to suggest that he was exceptionally appealing by some measure, at least when he chose to be. What form that might have taken I could only guess, and guessing is something that a true portraitist is loath to do. The earliest paintings of him from the first and second centuries show a handsome youth, but those portrayals reflected the influence of Roman fascination with Apollo rather than any true likeness of the Nazarene. Often the symbolic parallels came to be exploited and confused as the church was Romanized. For this reason, early church leaders prohibited artists from portraying Jesus in any manner which was physically strong or beautiful. They supported their position by emphasizing a 700 BC prophecy in the Old Testament book of Isaiah 53-2 regarding the future coming of their Messiah. He had no form or comeliness that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. Most scholars today agree that this prophecy cast a forward glance upon the Messiah's role and social demeanor rather than his physical appearance. In other words, the coming Messiah would not be a worldly prince, rich and well arrayed, from whom one would seek political favors, privilege, and financial advantage. In every way that interpretation was true. But would it not be odd if the Lord of life, who could raise the dead, were himself 
anything less than a picture of health and physical well-being? To me, that logic is inescapable. But to church authority, concerned only with establishing his spiritual supremacy, that passage from Isaiah was useful in diminishing any focus on his physical form. Most portrayals of him in the last 1700 years are a legacy from that decision. The power of tradition was ominous, and the more I knew, the less capable I felt. All the conditions that I stipulated were based on points of integrity about which I felt strongly. Therefore, it was an impossible scenario. How could I ever do this painting? The many tidbits were interesting, but if I just pieced them together, I would have a quilt, not a whole image with character and strength. After three months, every road I traveled led me to a dead end, and the contradictions before me were more than I could deal with intellectually. Now, what was I to do with what I had learned? By itself, it had no power or application. The answer came on November 23rd, 1991. The lovely autumn day portended nothing but its own beauty. Little did I know what was about to happen or that it would bring into focus the discordant affairs of previous years, opening windows to an inconceivable future. Clear morning light spread its fingers across the lawn, brightening everything in its path as it brought into focus a few bright red leaves still clinging to the trees of our large city lot. Such times are made for dwelling in thought when everything external is in perfect order. I would be alone all day, so there would be nothing to interrupt my peace of mind. As steam from the coffee warmed my face, the hammock rocked slowly, stirring the cool November air. Sorting through memories, I rather enjoyed the panoramic flashbacks of personal history. The recurring pattern was clearly one of new beginnings, yet with unmistakable irony, the most critical event was the one of uncommon destruction on Christmas 1989. If I had understood paradox then as well as I do now, perhaps I would have looked for prophecy in the reversals which had driven my life since that time. However, as I reviewed my thoughts in that clear November light, the only piece I found was in the hammock's rhythmic swing. It seemed to be gently suggesting, surrender, surrender, surrender. Despite my pleasant reveries, the awesome glow of nature was distracting me from the inner simplicity I needed. Besides, it was time for lunch. After a quick sandwich, I decided to linger in the dining room for meditation and prayer. This room was central to the house, and so when the chandelier was off, there was a pleasant half-darkness even at midday. It was a great room in which to be alone with God. This issue was between me and my holy source, and it truly needed to be resolved. My prayer began with protests, pleas, and conditions, which I hoped would bring resolution. Then I expressed my emotions, my doubts, and my fears, yet there was no peace forthcoming. Finally, asking forgiveness for ever considering anything so far beyond my capacity, I confessed that I had no passion for this project or at least not yet. Still, no result. Last of all, I considered that my engagement in this process was a stepping stone to some other more feasible undertaking which divine will envisioned for me. Exhausting myself through exploring all the possibilities of what that might be, I finally rested my head in folded arms on the table. For more than an hour, I slept. What aroused me was a brilliant glow in the room. At first, I thought that Brian had come home and flipped on the lights. Glancing upward, I observed the chandelier was still off. This did not surprise me because I sensed there was nothing artificial about this light. It was a soft white radiance which suffused the room like a cloud which had descended from heaven. The whole house possessed the stillness and silence of new fallen snow. Though the room was still, the air rippled like heat expanding air over a flame, except the ripples fall, flowed in all directions instead of just vertically. I traced the silvery, radiant patterns back to their source in the arched doorway 
and saw that they emanated from a spot of hyperluminescence, which was almost blinding. This resplendence was not flame-like, however, since the whole room possessed the same quality of light. The difference was in the intensity of the brilliance itself and the dazzling patterns of silver and gold with opalescent white and sparkles of lavender, blue, and rose. I could look toward the center for only a second before the brilliance caused my eyes to fill with tears. Stunned, I had to look away, and at that moment I heard sounds which formed the pattern and cadence of language, although it was not a language with which I was familiar. As the words formed a meaning in my mind, he said, Greetings, and called my name. There was an unmistakable holiness in this presence. I turned to look again, but the radiance was just too intense. Closing my eyes, I protected from the glow and wept at the same time. No sooner had I escaped within myself than the presence shot a beam of energy from itself to a point between my eyebrows. I felt a sensation of pressure between my eyebrows, which caused me to open my eyes and verify. What I saw was a stream of energy pouring in. Returning to the comfort of my inner vision, I watched as a picture was being etched into my awareness. It took about five seconds for the rendering to be completed. The vision seemed to be implanted in my optic nerve. It was stationary and available for me to look at whenever I chose. Mesmerized by its beauty, I directed my attention inward for another 15 or 20 minutes to gaze upon the vision of Jesus Christ, which was complete, three-dimensional, and holographic. He was majestically standing on top of a hill overlooking a green river valley. Unmistakably, it was the same landscape I had seen while driving through the New Mexico desert. Now it was complete with the master, grazing sheep, and a billowing cloud forming the shape of a lion. I couldn't have asked for a more vivid or realistic picture from which to paint. It was the next best thing to having him actually present. When my awareness finally externalized, I found that the radiant presence had gone and everything was back to normal. Nevertheless, I knew that I would never be the same again. That intuition proved to be true for everything in my life changed after that holy moment. For three days following the visitation, I spoke very little, not wanting to risk the loss of holiness which still lingered. I was afraid my voice would reflect my state of continuing awe. Then I would have to speak about that exceptional event. On the fourth day at breakfast, Brian caught my glance and I couldn't hold back any longer. I described it in all vivid detail as he looked at me with peaceful amazement. Graciously holding back the I told you so, which must have been on his mind, he offered to help me with the project in any way he could. Overcoming my insecurity was the help that I needed the most. That felt like an overwhelming task for anyone. As I described the vision in detail, mentioning the sheep in the pasture and the lamb which Jesus was holding, I saw a burst of inspiration in Brian's eyes. I know what I'll do. I'll call some sheep ranches and locate some lambs for you to study. By that afternoon, he had canvassed every sheep ranch within three countries. We were disappointed to find that late November was an unlikely season for lambs. Undaunted, Brian suggested a Saturday visit to my hometown farmer's market. Starting at the crack of dawn, with camera in hand, we were off to hunt for lambs. At least if I could hold a lamb and get a souvenir photo, then some progress would have been made. On arriving, we made a quick dash to the livestock area, only to meet with disappointment. There had been two lambs which had already sold by 8.30 that morning. Feeling out of luck and unsupported by heaven, I was ready to go home, but Brian was not. Let's go up this lane, he suggested. In a distant corner, we found a grizzled old dealer from South Texas which is scra with a scraggly flock of different breeds. It was an unimpressive assortment of dirty, lumpy, wool-bearing creatures. I started to turn away when, suddenly, 
One sparkling white ewe emerged from behind the flock and made her way over to me. I had never seen anything like her short, pristine, wool long neck and regal face. Her stately appearance was only enhanced by her obvious pregnancy. All I could think to call her was Mary from the nursery rhyme, for her fleece was white as snow. We bonded within minutes and I wanted to take her home. Realizing there would soon be a lamb, it occurred to me that purchasing Mary would make them both available for study. The greater coincidence was that our restored farmhouse was zoned for agriculture, even though it was nestled within the city. There we were, two rookie city shepherds look at loading Mary into the back seat of our Cadillac. She still sparkled, even outside her natural environment, which prompted me to ask the dealer about her breed. She's a mouflon, he answered as I handed him my check. That meant nothing to me, and so without further conversation, we drove away. We felt a little sheepish as people gawked and laughed at our backseat passenger, but what did they know? To distract ourselves from the embarrassment, we cooed to Mary and made plans for her housing. Then Brian inquired, what's a mouflon? Neither of us knew, but we were suddenly frozen with anxiety that maybe we had just purchased one of those new hybrids, which were not yet on earth when Jesus walked it. I had visited my uncle's sheep ranch many times as a girl, and I had never seen anything like her. The more I thought about it, the more it became an issue, for any modern element would surely compromise the painting's integrity. After Mary was settled in her quarters, I headed off to the library to get my question answered. I found what I was looking for very quickly as I opened the pages of an encyclopedia. In amazement and disbelief, I looked for confirmation from two other sources. The mouflon was recognized as the oldest domesticated breed of sheep in Europe and is considered to be the ancestor of all domesticated varieties. Moreover, it was commonly herded in the Middle East 2,000 years ago. I reread those passages until they were committed to memory, and with private elation I pondered the miracle of how many parts of the puzzle had to have already been in place for such an amazing act of perfection to occur. Short of traveling to the Middle East and bartering with a Bedouin, I could not have obtained a more suitable sheep to model for the painting. The odds of finding Mary in my hometown were staggering to the imagination. As a child, I had played on the very ground where I found Mary. How long ago, I wondered, was this painting committed to destiny? With all our plans for the holidays, we agreed that it would be better to start the painting early in January. Besides, this would give me time to make some preparatory decisions and get the canvas ready. The first thing I needed to establish was the scale. So I cast my attention on the vision and asked for guidance from Jesus. This was the first time it ever occurred to me to regard the vision as a means through which to dialogue. The answer was clearly given to me in a telepathic mode, though no words were spoken. The canvas was to be 48 inches square. That was a restless December. I felt like a racehorse waiting for the gate to open. Reassuring myself frequently with inward glances, the vision remained crystal clear and seemed to intimate that a whole new world was being born. It was clearly living, and I beheld it in wonder. Even more incredibly, as I looked upon the vision over the next few days and weeks, details began to take shape. It was growing by collecting its life force and then manifesting all that it was. This vision became more and more alive. The energy pulled to itself so much of his life force that what started out as only a visual phenomenon gave witness to a feeling that he was there. Miraculously, he found ways to make me comfortable during those weeks before I began the painting, although I can't say that I ever got used to it. Finally, there I was in my studio on January 2nd, a Friday, beholding the emptiness of that large blank canvas. I could not stop smiling as I picked up my pencil and began to transcribe his presence onto the pure white surface. 
The only thing which troubled me at all was the awkwardness of looking inward to see him and then looking outwardly to transcribe the vision. No sooner had I considered that to be a difficulty than the most startling thing happened. The inner vision was transformed to occupy its own space within the room. After that, whenever I worked at my easel, he would appear as a presence of three-dimensional reality before me. From then on, it was more than a vision. He was there and we would become a team for creating the painting. It took two or three days to complete the drawing, so I didn't start painting until the following week. After applying the first layer of paint, I expected to be taking some time off. Such is the way it is with oil paint, which has a lengthy drying time. That is one of the time-consuming aspects of the medium. Fortunately, some of the colors dry a little faster than others, so there's usually some part of the canvas upon which I could work. Nevertheless, waiting at least one day is typical. The next morning I entered the studio to check on the canvas, everything was dry. Absolutely everything. I was shocked. I never used dryers or thinners because the constitution and longevity of the paint could be compromised. So how is this happening? It was a mystery treat to me. But the fact was, the painting always dried within hours, not days, for the duration of the project. This had a tremendous impact on its estimated date of completion. Working together with the Son of God had a lot of advantages. For one thing, the relationship occurred in a synchronous realm which might be called the miracle zone. My greatest difficulty w was in getting used to it. Accepting the idea that there were not going to be problems was a greater adjustment than one might think. In this world, we have to come to regard problems as normal. The timing of everything was flawless, and all of my needs were provided. Except for Sundays, the painting unfolded without interruption until February 6th. I had gone as far as possible without the lamb and expected to get some time off. That new agenda, however, was shot down precisely at 4 o'clock the next morning. Brian got up in the middle of the night to get a glass of milk and check on Mary. When he cast his flashlight back toward the barn, instead of seeing one pair of eyes, he saw two. He woke me up and we ran out to catch our first glimpse of the baby, wobbly and wet. He's so precious, I said, and that became his name. I did get some time off though, because Precious was so tiny and vulnerable. At first, he would just fall asleep in our arms, so we celebrated his birth and played with him for the first two days. He posed for the painting when he was three days old. An element typical to most creative projects is something artists call jungle time. That's the process of getting lost in all the options and problems in order to find the answers through instinct, ingenuity, and creative resourcefulness. Jungle time is part of the allure of any creative pursuit because in it the artist explores his uniqueness and emerges from it with a signatory resolution. For the first time in my life, that process had no attraction or irre irrelevance for me. I was content to proceed with neither problems nor expectation. Despite that surrender, however, there was no feeling of being an illustrator because a higher form of creation was constantly surprising me with its own dynamic unfolding. Nevertheless, I began to wonder if there might be some small, appropriate contribution I could make to proclaim, if only to myself, that I was here. As I surveyed the whole composition, it occurred to me that it contained no symbolic recognition of the Trinity or at least I did not see it at the time. I had just painted the little boat that floats on the river, and with a flash of ingenuity, I got the idea of adding two more boats to create a flotilla of three. They would be so tiny as to be hardly noticeable, except that I would know. I promptly went to work on the miniature fleet with poised confidence that it would be suitably respectful and discreet. The first boat was a simple construction hardly more than six or seven brushstrokes. However, the other two just would not manifest. 
No matter where I placed them, they could not integrate with the vision or fit into the landscape. After spending the bulk of a day stressing over two stick figure boats, I finally realized the only difficulty I had encountered with the painting was of my own doing. With peaceful resignation and deeper understanding, I turned to Jesus and remarked, I guess there's just one boat. He grinned and replied, I guess there is. There was only one other occasion when I interjected my own will into the process. That was prompted by a sense of doubt about the vision, or perhaps by a subtle premonition of things to come. There's an oak tree to the left of center in the painting. In the vision, its trunk was split, and I questioned Jesus about that. The oak tree is often a symbol of strength, I pointed out. Are you sure you want it split? He looked at me, accepting my reasoning, but not agreeing with it. With quiet authority, he turned the question back to me. How is it in the vision? Well, it's split, I replied. Then that's the way it must be. It would be some months before I could know and appreciate the full implication of his answer. Work proceeded without a hitch after that. However, there was a startling revelation about two weeks before its completion. When I got up to leave the room for my afternoon coffee break, I looked back to check on my work as I always did. This time it looked back as if to check on me. With holographic projection, the whole painting turned to face me. I stopped short in my tracks and gasped, then ran back to the other side of the painting. It continued to face me from every angle. Three-dimensional rendition is a standard of excellence in the art of realistic painting. However, there is a difference between holographic projection and three-dimensional illusion. Old master paintings are renowned for their convincing illusions projecting in all directions. In such portraits, eyes may often follow the viewer. That doesn't mean, however, that the illusions will leap in front of the canvas with full compositions projecting absently. In holographic projection, complex forms will realign and reproject according to the changing angles of perception. It was quite phenomenal to see this happening in the painting. It is my standard procedure to paint in privacy, showing the works only when they are finished. Brian knew that and was respectful of my wishes. At that moment, therefore, I did not share my discovery with him. Only our cat Gunner had seen the painting in progress. There was no way of keeping Gunner out of my studio, for that was his bedroom. I presumed he could see Jesus, for he sat perched on my drawing board facing the vision, staring hours upon end every day. Jesus had spoken to him several times and petted him once. That evening he watched in quiet amazement, wondering what all the commotion was about. From that day forward the painting took on a life of its own. Its integrity was complete unto itself and true to the vision. Without embellishment, I followed the inspiration before me and found it a joy to surrender to higher creation. The painting has remained holographic, and today viewers find the variable projections of imagery and expression to be an empowering enhancement to their communion with the painting. Even the best of things must eventually end, and in the case of this project, I was certainly glad that I was not the one to decide when that would be. From the beginning, I had recognized that the vision had such power, I could see myself 20 years hence still trying to perfect it. Therefore, I was actually relieved when heaven decided to wrap it up. That was March 12, 1992. On that day, there was so little left to do that I was down to polishing particulars. There were a few strokes I wanted to add to Jesus' hair. It was blowing in the wind, and I wanted to separate the strands to show a lightness of air passing through it. One after another, I put these final touches in place. When I looked up, I was startled to see the vision dissolving into a cloud of sparkling light. Almost in panic, I looked inward to the point where it had been joined to my consciousness, but the cord had been severed. Settling my brush down, I smiled, then smiled bigger unable to suppress the joy I felt. As I beheld the vision departing, I also witnessed a beginning, 
for as the visual image faded, the love and energy of his essence settled in upon the canvas. The painting was finished, but its life had only begun. Many who have seen the painting feel a living presence within it. The lamb and the lion is more than just linen and paint. It is now a conduit for the life force of the original version, and those who view the painting may continue to enjoy it as an extension of the master's power and love. After Jesus left, I visited with him many times through the painting. Most especially, I wanted to know, what next? What am I to do with this artifact you have left in my custody?